Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today at Klondike Church on this online service. Whether this is your first time checking out a church service ever, or you've been a Christian a long time, we do want to warmly welcome you today. And if you're a part of the Klondike Church family, please know we miss you so much, and we can't wait to be back together in person. So as we begin this service today, whether you're watching on YouTube or whether you're watching on Facebook, no, we believe it is a privilege and honor to be with you as we spend some time together slowing down, stilling our hearts, and worshiping the King of Kings. Now, listen, as we are going in this service together, I encourage you to sing along with us. I encourage you to open your Bible and read the scriptures together with us, to participate in the prayers that we do right where you're at, and may God work in all of our hearts together. My name is Pastor Josh. I'm one of the elders at the church, and I'd love to connect with you. So if you're a guest today, know that you can go online to lovepensacola.org slash connect. That's our online website for connection. And you can just fill out a few questions on there and know that we'd just love to have record that you were watching this service today. Also, if we can pray for you in any way, please go to lovepensacola.org slash need prayer. And you can put your prayer request in. We'll keep it confidential. Our ministry team leaders would love to pray for you. If you would like someone to contact you, if you'd like me to contact you, I'd love to do so. Just let us know in the notes. If you would prefer that, I can contact you direct. But we want to say that we care about what you're going through right now. And most importantly, Jesus cares the most. So, friends, look to him. Our mission as a church is to be a church passionate about proclaiming and living the gospel by loving God and loving our community for his kingdom and glory. This service is one of the many ways we as a church family are seeking to not only worship and love God first, but also love the community of Pensacola he's placed us in. So thank you again for being with us today. And now as we continue and begin the service, Pastor Stewart, one of the elder elders, is going to come up and he's going to lead us in a call to worship from God's word. I'll see you in just a little bit. Good morning and welcome to worship today. We're glad you can join us today via online. And we pray that the Lord has been blessing you this week and you've been seeking his face in prayer and seeking him in his word this week. As I call you to worship this morning, hear with me out of 1 Chronicles 16. The word of the Lord says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing songs to him, talk of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord, seek the Lord and his strength seek his face forevermore may that be our prayer and our heart during this time may we not wander with social media and spend all our time aimlessly scrolling and commenting and thinking on these things but may we seek the lord may we sing of his praises may we seek his word may we seek his face may we seek him forevermore let us pray oh god we thank you for allowing us to gather this morning Lord, we thank you that you are King of King and Lord of Lords. Lord, you are a rock, you are a refuge, you are everything, O Christ our King. So Lord, we ask that you be with us this morning as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Rid our hearts and our minds of distractions today. That we may focus on you, on your holiness, on your righteousness, on your salvation that you give, O Christ. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. Be with us now as we worship you. And it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Soul and glory turn to 
continue in worship at this time, our God invites us to come to him and bring all of the sins of the past week, all the ways we failed him, in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, and confess them together. So join me as we confess our sins together in the words of Psalm 79. Oh, do not remember former iniquities against us. Let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us, for we have been brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation, for the glory of your name, and deliver us, and provide atonement for our sins, for your name's sake, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. From the prophet Isaiah, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Praise God for the forgiveness of sins. Join me in prayer at this time. O oh Lord, thank you that we can worship you this day. O oh God, you are such a good God to allow us to come to you. Even when things are really hard, things keep failing. We keep failing and falling down. You are so merciful to lift us up and to give us life, new life, forgiveness of sins, encouragement, and comfort that you are with us. You're really here as we are separated in different rooms and homes all around our community and around the world. God, you are with us all, and that brings us together. We praise you, Lord. Help us to watch over our souls and our bodies this week. God, please be with us. Please be with children I pray that they've gotten rest this weekend and they're prepared for another week of home education. For parents, Lord, struggling and trying to figure out a new rhythm of life, oh Lord, encourage them and bless them. For our educators at this time, God, please strengthen them. Please give them resilience in these changing days. God, for those who are single in our church family and those single watching, oh Lord, may they be reminded of your presence that you would never leave us or forsake us. Be their help and their hope. Help them to find community in this hard time. I pray, God, for marriages that are struggling, where there's extra tension right now because of finances, close quarters, 
Lord, help us to remember love is not a feeling. It is a covenant decision. And may we look to you closely, Jesus, and remember what love really is, O oh Lord. For those who are anxious and worried and battling depression, even today, I pray the music and your word would minister to their heart and help them, O oh Lord. Provide our needs. Provide financial needs, spiritual needs, according to your riches and glory. Please be with our president, Donald Trump, our Congress. Please be with the senators and the congressmen and women. Please, Lord, be with our governor, DeSantis, and the Escambia County uh, uh, leaders, Lord, in our city council and our mayor. Lord, we need help in Pensacola, and this nation needs your help. We repent of our national sins. We confess, Lord, we are worthy of judgment. And yet we pray for your mercy. Awaken hearts to the gospel today and throughout our nation this coming week. Help us to be light in the world and to show your love. We ask in Jesus' holy and faithful name. And God's people said, Amen and Amen. Please join me now and let's continue to worship and sing together to our Lord.
would join with me as we continue in worship at this time by responsibly reading the Word of God this morning. Open your Bibles with me to Psalm 27. If you open your Bibles about to the middle of it, you should arrive somewhere in Psalm, and we're going to responsibly read together Psalm 27. I am reading out of the New King James Version this morning, so if you have that, join with me. If not, uh, whatever Bible you have, and the words will be on the screen for you to join me. Please join with me on the odd verses this morning as we read. The Word of the Lord says, Psalm 27, a Psalm of David. Join with me on the odd verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire his temple. For in this time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifice of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then teach, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in the smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah. 
As we continue in worship at this time, I want to invite you to take a Bible and please turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 20. Psalm chapter 20, as we focus today on a prayer during trouble, a prayer during trouble. Many people have come up to me as a pastor in the last few weeks and have asked me this question. Is the trouble of COVID-19 sent by God? Is the trouble we are going through in this quarantine and COVID-19 sent by God? Now, that's a huge question that I want to kind of answer just in one way with one observation. There's many ways to really look and think through that question. But stop with me and just think about one perspective of what has happened over these last few weeks. I actually want to step back a little to my childhood for a minute. In my lifetime, I have watched the world and particularly the United States of America, go from practicing a weekly Sabbath to purposefully and proudly rejecting the idea of Sabbath. Today, we live in an age where Sunday is now Sunday fun day. We have chosen professional sports like football and baseball over worship. Kids activities, kids sports, t-ball and travel leagues and soccer leagues have been chosen over church. We love nature and fishing and hunting and the beach instead of praise. And if we're to be honest, many of us love money and working just for the sake of financial gain and the love of work and a thousand other things over resting, Sabbathing in God. And it's like in COVID-19, God says, you have chosen all these things over me and over my worship. Well, I am going to take them all away. You choose professional sports over me, I am going to close the stadiums. You choose kids' leagues over me, your sports teams are canceled. You choose nature over me, the beaches, the parks are now all closed. You have chosen money and career over me, businesses are shut down. The economy is reeling and unsteady. For many, we have chosen even our careers or just simple basic entertainment, our phones and technology and things of this nature over our God and our children. And so now all of a sudden, it seems to me that many parents for the first time over are not blessed to be at home, but they feel more like they are trapped at home with their children. For many, trying to raise them for the very first time. I know these are strong words. But I think if we want to really be honest and seek the help of God in this time of trouble, we've got to do some personal introspection. It's like God in his mercy has put the whole world into a giant Sabbath. This is another opportunity for you and for me to figure out why are our hearts so restless? Why are we always looking to everything else for hope and rest instead of God? This sermon is how we pray in a time of trouble, to find the rest we need. Now, we're not exactly sure when or why Psalm 20 was written. It's a psalm of David the king. We know that. From verse 3 and verse 7, there's been a good idea given, and that is that the nation is in great trouble. And it is possibly even a military situation, maybe invasion. And so during this very hot, heavy, struggle, fearful time of anxiety, David has went to the tabernacle. He has worshiped the Lord in sacrifice. The people have joined him in praying for the mercy of God over their nation in this very scary time. And while many people are trusting in the wrong things, David is teaching his people how to pray and to trust in the right things. And then David has recorded this prayer for you and for me to help us to connect with God during such a time of trouble. In fact, some of the great leaders of the past, like Martin Luther, said this prayer is a battle cry to draw us to prayer. We can use these words to awaken us, to do battle with sin and with the wrong desires in our hearts. Calvin said that this prayer was a common form of prayer for us, the church, to be used whenever we are threatened in any kind of a danger. And we surely are. So take your scriptures. Let's read together Psalm chapter 20 verses 1 through 9, 
and ask the Lord to help us in our time of trouble to find rest in him. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt sacrifice. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and they have fallen. But we have risen and we stand upright. Save, Lord, may the king answer us when we call. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we enter into this psalm, you notice that David is teaching us how to pray in trouble. Some people think it is kind of a weird thing to find the king of Israel telling other people how to pray for him. But I think God's word encourages us to be honest and open when we need prayer, to be a people that are willing to share with others what we're going through, how we need people to pray for us. Yes, David was a great leader, and yet he did not despise the prayers of those who lived in his nation, in his community. In fact, you think like Paul the Apostle, he often begged for the saints in the churches to pray for him. So this is not weird for a great and godly leader to teach us how to pray. And I would say we need to listen to one another in our prayer needs. So this passage begins, may the Lord answer you in the time of trouble. Now, the old translation said, may the Lord hear you. The idea is actively hear you, not passively hear you, but literally to hear in such a way as to do something about it. It's like Psalm chapter three, verse four, where it says, I cried to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. It is our duty in a time of trouble to start with prayer, to start by calling out to God who hears. So let me ask you, do we have trouble right now? Tribulation, check. Affliction, check. Distress, check. Mental anguish, check. Adversity, check. Difficulties and dangers, check. I mean, we are living in a age of trouble, which I think shows us something. When he says the, the day of trouble, it shows us that godly people are not exempted from troubles. Don't become discouraged if you find yourself in trouble. Even a man after God's own heart, like King David, who loved God deeply, had to suffer trouble. Matthew Henry, the great writer and preacher, has said, Neither the crown on David's head nor the grace in his heart exempted him from trouble. The greatest of men and women, the godliest of men and women, had to endure sorrow and needed the prayers of others to get through the hard days. Friends, Jesus said, in this world, not you might have tribulation, or it's possible. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you can't lose your job. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean your health could not be in jeopardy. Just because you're a Christian does not mean that things could not get dark real quick all around you, or even in the depths of your soul. Christians go through seasons of trouble. The difference is not us going through trouble or not going through trouble. It's how we go through trouble and who we go through trouble with. That's what the difference is. Think about the great hymn writer John Newton. He said, through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. Many of us feel like we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death right now. Sometimes you feel that way after watching the news and then going to Walmart for a few minutes. It's crazy, the mental perspective that has changed in us during this time of pandemic. Friends, not only are we prospect for trouble, 
I want you to remember that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He had his own sorrows, but he also bore the griefs of you and me. At his birth, there was no room in the inn. King Herod oppressed him and tried to have him killed in his infancy. He was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. He was harassed by the scribes and the Pharisees continually. He was hurt by the hard hearts and the unbelief of his family members and the nation who often rejected him. At particular seasons in his life, we are told that he was troubled or that his soul was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. He endured the cruel mockings of men, of the chief priests and the religious leaders and the common people on the cross. Two robbers mocked him on the cross. And then, most of all, he had to bear the sins of his people on the cross as God the Father poured out wrath on the Son, Jesus, forsaken by him. And yet when he was in the garden, bleeding drops of blood, and when he was on the cross, that did not stop him from praying to God. In the day of trouble, he prayed. We are not exempt from trouble, brothers and sisters. Now, David had prophets and priests and King, and many good people to pray for the king, yet he did not think it above him to ask for their prayers and to pray along with him. Now you notice it says, May the name of the God of Jacob defend you in your trouble. When I read this here, I'm reminded that three times in verse 1, verse 5, and verse 7, this psalm talks about the name of God. The name of God means the person of God. We do not pray to an unknown God. We don't pray to a God that we get to invent. He's talking about the one true creator God, the God of this world. I want you to think for a minute of this great statement A.W. Tozer made in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What when someone asks you, who is God? What comes into your mind? That is usually the most important thing about you. What I mean by that is the strength or weakness of your faith is built on who your God is, who you confess him to be. Psalm chapter 9, verse 10 says, Those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forgotten those who seek you. Friends, it is a breaking of the first and second commandment when we worship God, when we pray to God, but it's not the true God. What did the Ten Commandments say? You should have no other gods before me. You should not make for yourself a graven image. And yet, how many people, they're not worshiping the God of Jacob, the God revealed in Scripture. They're worshiping a God they have made up in their own minds. Jacob is the patriarch. He is the one who is the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham. He is the one who God made a covenant with. And then, with Jacob's descendants, the people of Israel, and now with us, spiritual Israel, the church. Oh, friends, understand that God said to Jacob in Genesis 28, verse 15, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you will go. He said the same thing to Joshua and Moses. He said the same thing to the prophets. And Jesus says the same thing to the church today. I will be with you always to the end of the age. Just as God blessed Jacob after Jacob went through his time of trouble and he wrestled with the angel, God blessed him. So God will defend us. He will raise us up to safety. Again, Christians go through trouble, but how we go through it is so different. We don't go through it alone. We have the church praying with us and for us. We have God with us in the trouble. Spurgeon said, what a mercy that we may pray in the day of trouble. And still what a more blessed privilege that no trouble can prevent the Lord from hearing us. Troubles roar like thunder, but the believer's voice will be heard above the storm. You see, no matter how loud the storm is raging in your life, the trouble is in this country, God will hear your voice above the storm if you call out to him in prayer. So verse 2 says, may he send help from the sanctuary. It's amazing. Our weakness in the flesh will not allow us to go directly to God in heaven. So God has chosen to come down to us. In the Old Testament, God commanded Israel to build a tabernacle. 
And in that tabernacle was the holy place, the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant. And God chose to reside with his people in a special way right there in Zion, in Jerusalem. Today, while we do not have an earthly physical tabernacle, God has chosen to reside with us now in a new way. He said, I will be with you always. How? He dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. How does he dwell with us? Through the Lord's Supper, when we take the bread and the cup and we receive him in grace. How? Where two or three are gathered in my name. You see, we're no longer separated. Even though we're in different houses today, the church is a body that is united in the Holy Spirit. And together we are all worshiping Jesus in our homes. And Jesus is bringing us all together. And with Christians all around the world, in Africa and in Asia and Australia and South America, North America and Europe, we're all together as one family. May the Lord strengthen you out of Zion. Listen, David had mighty guards. He had the, the palace guards. He had the warriors of Israel. They were mighty men. And yet his strength came from God first and foremost. And so today I ask you, can the Lord help you out of his sanctuary? Have we neglected God's sanctuary, his people, his table, his word, his spirit for so long? And now this COVID-19, this time of trouble is reminding us we need the Lord. Look how this prayer continues in verses three through five. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. I want you to notice before David goes to battle, he goes to the tabernacle. Before David goes to engage in a big fight in this time of trouble, he goes to God first for help. What a reminder, verse 3, is that before we make big decisions, life-changing decisions, we should not simply follow our gut. We should not simply go with the flow, what our friends tell us to do or what the culture at large tells us. We shouldn't simply go with our feelings. Friends, we need to go to God. We need God's word to guide us. We need to offer our hearts to him as a sacrifice, asking for his guidance and protecting care. May he remember all your offerings. Now, this is talking about a non-bloody offering, the grain offerings, the thanksgiving offerings. You see, David started by thanking God for his blessings so far. But then, may he accept your burnt offerings. These were the bloody sacrifices of the Old Testament. These were the sacrifices that admitted the guilt and the sin of the people and the need for forgiveness. You can think about it this way. The people of ancient Israel were in an agrarian society. There were shepherds. There were uh, shepherds that, you know, they had cattle, they had goats, they had sheep. And it was very common, almost a daily practice, where you would have to go kill an animal. And then you would, of course, clean it and butcher it and prepare it for your family to eat. It's not like today where you just go to grocery stores, you go to the Walmart, and you're able to buy your groceries already prepared and butchered for you. And so it was not unfamiliar for the people of that day to see animals killed. But you see, there had to be sacrifices at the tabernacle and later the temple because they were all pointing forward to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus. And today, the only way we can get help from God in trouble is not by our own works. It is by going to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Everything starts at the cross of Jesus. Everything. And so in verse 4, from the cross, in other words, we don't uh, get from God to get to God. We get God first in Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden we are his children and we begin to follow him. So that's what happens in verse 4. It says, may he grant you according to your heart's desire. This is not a uh, magic wand. This is not a uh, God if you're one of the kids watching right now, I want the, the newest video game system, the new Xbox or PlayStation that's coming out. God, I want my parents to give me everything I want, every kind of food I want, exempt me from everything I don't want to do. This is not parents. I want my kids to just instantly behave. Now I've wished it and it's done. So that would be great. 
This is not some sort of a, a magical incantation where we can all of a sudden just make demands of God and get anything. The idea here is David is praying about the time of trouble. He's praying for his people, for his nation, for his soul that's in trouble. That's what God grants the answer to. It's like what Jesus said in John 14. If you ask anything in my name, this is a prayer according to God's will and God's plan for us. These are the prayers he answers the way that we desire. So then notice it says next, we will rejoice in your salvation in verse 5. It's amazing to me that many of us pray in the foxhole. We pray we're in trouble, but we don't pray when the battle is over. How many people pray desperately on the sickbed, and then when they're healed, they forget God? How many people need a miracle, and they pray, and they make promises to God, but then they never give Him thanks, and they don't continue to keep their word and follow Him later? Matthew Henry has said, those that have their eye upon the salvation of the Lord shall never, shall ever have their hearts filled with the joy of that salvation. Listen to me, friends. It is one thing to pray to God. It's another thing to follow through with your prayers when he brings safety and he brings deliverance. No person on earth is so afflicted, so forsaken, and so troubled and so oppressed that God cannot save you. doesn't matter what kind of trouble you're going through. You're not so messed up that God cannot save you. And in the same way, no person is so great and so mighty and so strong as to not need help from God Most High. We all need his safety and his deliverance. Now, I love what it says here. We will set up our banners. This is kind of a, a weird statement to many of us in 2020. But it shouldn't be if you think about it. In fact, outside of our church building, uh, we have an American flag in honor of the, the people who serve our country. Now, we don't have an American flag in the sanctuary of the church because uh, the kingdom of the church is not of this world. Jesus said, my house should be a house of prayer for all nations. This is not an American church. It's a Christian church. We don't worship our country or pledge our country in a building like this. We worship the Lord. This place is set apart to the Lord's kingdom. But on our property, we do have a flag here, which does remind us that we should pray for our leaders. That's what it reminds me when I look at it and honor them. That's what scripture calls us to. And the idea of having a banner is like a flag. Conquerors display a flag when they win. And so um, I remember back in 1997, it was June 30th, July 1st, 1997, midnight, when Hong Kong officially reverted rule back to China after 156 years of the British having control of this. And I, I watched it the other day, a video of this on YouTube, and it was uh, really a, a sober thing to watch. And so what happened was when Hong Kong went under Brit from British rule to Chinese rule at midnight, the British flag went down concurrently with the Chinese flag going up, symbolizing that China now had authority there. And the idea here is that we are in a war. We will courageously, with the strength of God in the time of trouble, push forward. We will keep loving our children, keep praying with them, keep pointing them to Jesus. We will keep loving our neighbors, keep praying for our president, no matter how they misrepresent us and our political pundits and leaders. We will keep being light of Jesus to a world in darkness, no matter how we are oppressed. We will keep engaging with the enemies of sin and Satan in the world as good soldiers of Christ, trusting, waving the flag of Jesus Christ in his love. In Jeremiah chapter 50, the prophet there talks about the idols of a nation. Now, our idols tend to be on the shelf, on the television, and in sports and toys, right? He who dies with the most toys still dies is the real way to say it. But we have idols in our nation, too. I mentioned them at the beginning of this sermon. In Jeremiah 50, we are told the prophet says there, Declare among the nations and proclaim, and set up a banner and proclaim. Conceal it not and say, Babylon is taken. Bel is put to shame. Merodach is dismayed. Her images are put to shame. Her idols are dismayed. This is a statement that Christ the great captain of our salvation has obtained a complete victory over all of our enemies. 
Revelation 20 says Satan is bound and can no longer deceive the nations. While he's out like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, he cannot stop the light of the gospel from saving sinners around the world. May we hang the flag, not simply of our country, but the flag of Jesus Christ our Lord and proudly proclaim with our mouths and our prayers and our praises every single day, he is our king and he is our God. I read a story not long ago about Louis XIII of France and how he had come against one of the cities of the, the French Huguenots, the Calvinist Huguenots who were rebels against him. And Louis XIII was besieging this city. And one evening, during a time where there was no conflict, these Christian Huguenots got up on the wall of the city and they began to sing with beautiful sweetness and solemnity, one of their favorite psalms. They just began to praise and worship God in a moment of peace on the wall. The king, King Louis, was so impressed with the whole scene and with the spirit of the singers, he turned to his favorite general, who was by his side, and he said, we can do nothing with these people. The siege was raised the next day, and the persecuted Huguenots triumphed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God should be remembered in our time of need. We should sing to him. We should wave his flag. If we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he will give us the victory. Listen, confession of the name of Christ is the only way that we have victory in these terrible storms and troubles of life. Let's look at verses uh, 6 through 8 now. 6. I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Now listen, those who partake in the troubles of this world will one day be partakers of the victory of Christ. Are you down now? One day Jesus is going to lift you up. The merciful will inherit the meek will inherit the earth. Those who are merciful will obtain mercy. God's not done with you in your trouble yet. I know, what great confidence. I know without doubt, the Lord saves his anointed. Now, it's important to say that every king of ancient Israel were the anointed. Literally, when they became king, the high priest would take oil and anoint over their head oil to symbolize they could not rule in their own strength. They needed the power of God. They needed the Holy Spirit to give them a spirit of wisdom and knowledge and fear of the Lord. Things we should pray for all the time. Isaiah 11 talks about them. And so they would anoint their head with oil. David was anointed with oil by Samuel the prophet. And, and the people are saying, we know the Lord will save his anointed. But friends, I want to remind you who the great anointed one was. The Messiah, the Christ Jesus. When we read the Bible, we see Jesus is called the anointed one. When he began his public ministry, he went to the Jordan River. He was baptized by John the Baptist. And at that time, the Holy Spirit came down like a dove upon him. And he was anointed as prophet, priest, and king to be our Savior and our Lord. And now he says, I will be with you always. How is that the case? The Bible tells us he has given us another comforter, the Holy Spirit who abides with us forever. We are anointed with the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. We have a choice every day. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit's in you. This means the way you work is going to be different. The way you make decisions is going to be different. The way you talk is going to be different. The way you think is going to be different. The way you parent, the way you act, is going to be different. Will you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and pray, God, the Holy Spirit, fill me today? Or will you be filled with the flesh? Look, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave the children of God. Being filled has the idea of control. Will the Spirit control you or will the old person control you? Will your sin nature can control you? He has given you his Spirit. And the one who is filled with the Spirit will pray for the right things, will walk in the right path, and he will forgive and answer from heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Listen, when it says his right hand, the right hand is the hand of strength. No offense to you lefties that are out there. But the reality is most of us are right-handed. And when the Bible talks about the right hand, it's talking about the strong hand 
the omnipotence of God. God can do anything. With God, all things are possible, no matter how hard the trouble is you're facing. So no matter what your sorrow, no matter what your work, no matter what your trouble, there is nothing too hard for the Lord right now. So verse 7 says, Some people trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Now look, this is why people think David was about to go to war. This verse right here. The war chariot was the greatest advantage a nation could have. It carried many men into battle. It brought speed. It brought protection. Only the rich and powerful had the chariot in the day of David. It also mentions the horses, the cavalry. Again, only the wealthy would have horses that they would take into battle. And so many times, nations, of course, would trust in their superior uh, skills, their superior weapons, their superior cavalry, their superior chariots to have the victory. What are our horses and chariots today? Some trust in nuclear weapons. Some trust in tanks. Some trust in politicians. Some trust in a good economy. Some trust in health experts. Some trust in the federal government. Some trust in my own works, what I have done, how successful I am, how hard of a worker I am. Friends, Psalm 33, verse 17 says, The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. Listen, the battle is not to the strong. If you're going to glory, glory in the Lord. Ungodly people are so blinded by their pride, by their strength, they are like Goliath who was a giant and had that large broadsword and the armor bearer, and he thought it nothing not to rely on God. In fact, he cursed the name of God. And yet God brought that giant down. You will be overcome if you trust in the wrong thing. John Calvin has said, It is impossible for the one who promises himself victory by confiding in his own strength to have his eyes turned toward God. If it's all about you, and willpower, and you just trying to do better and work harder and trying to get through on your own, you'll never have your eyes on God. If you're always looking down on everyone else, you'll never be looking up and having the help of God. Don't do it in your own strength. It says here, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Why does it say that? Because we are so prone and quick to forget the name of God. We forget him all the time. Every morning we wake up and we have a choice. Do I surf the web? Do I turn on the TV? Or do I hear from God? Every night before we go to bed, what's the last thing we put into our minds? What do we listen to? Every time we get in the car, what do we turn on? It is so quick and easy to forget who God is. That is our weakness. We must know the true God, his name, his attributes, his persons, his works. How has God worked in the past? Who is this true God as revealed in the Holy Scriptures? We need the true God to get through the day and every single day. This passage ends in verses 8 and 9. Look with me at it. They have bowed down and they have fallen, but we have risen and we stand upright. Save, Lord. Save, Lord. May the King answer us when we call. Listen to me. If you're trusting in the wrong things, your adrenaline's going to run out sooner or later. Sooner or later, your marriage is going to fall apart. Sooner or later, you're going to collapse. Sooner or later, you're going to fall back into addiction or maybe a new addiction. Sooner or later, kids, you're going to blow it. Your willpower is not going to do it. You're going to lose it on your parents. You're going to fall back into your old ways. If you trust in your own strength or the strength of others, sooner or later, you're going to fall down. You're going to be bowed down, overthrown, and powerless. But if you humble yourself, if you turn to the Lord in the day of your trouble, it says here that the Almighty's arm will lift you up and the victory of Jesus will be the blessing to his people. Philippians 2 says, One day at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, I don't care how depressed and troubled and down you are. If you humble yourself instead of being broken. If you humble yourself and cry out to God, trusting in God, the dry bones will live again. They will stand upon their feet in exceeding great army.
The righteous will flourish. Peace will come in your heart. You will no more be restless, searching for hope. Jesus will be your hope and peace. Look to Christ. Listen, the righteous fear God and they cling to him and they trust him with their all. But the wicked fear God and they are terrified and they are driven from his presence. They run from him as far as they can. How will you respond to God and the trouble in which we live? Verse 9 is so important. It's a prayer not just of David. It's a prayer we could pray every day. It's not a prayer simply of the one who's lost and get saved. It's the prayer of the saved every day. Save Lord. Yahweh, save us. May the King answer us when we call. Listen, our confidence of success can only come from the salvation of the Lord. If you're looking in all the wrong places, if you're trying on your own to get through this quarantine and COVID-19, If you want to just go back to business as normal when this is done, God is warning you today, don't do it. Listen, this this thing will either make you more humble and more sensitive to the love of God, or it will make you more harder because you will think in your own strength you got through it. You will either look to the King, the King of Kings, God Almighty, And he will answer you and he will change your life and he will be with you. Or you will look to yourself and you will be bowed down and you will fall exhausted one day. You will collapse and be broken. Listen, the Bible takes this so seriously. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So I ask you, where is your rest? Where is your Sabbath? Who are you looking to for help today? If you're not a Christian today, you're in light and darkness. Those are the choices, light and darkness. It is either Satan or Jesus. If you look to Jesus, you have salvation and light. If you look to yourself, you have Satan and darkness. If you will cry out to him, Lord, save me right now. Jesus Christ lived the perfect life to set you free. But friend, if you are a Christian today, And you've been doing it on your own. You haven't been remembering the name of the Lord. You have not been crying out to him in the day of trouble. Listen, there's a reason why you're down and broken. But it's not too late for him to lift you up and change you. If you would just look to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We would pray together right now. And in the silence, let us seek the Lord. Oh God, we come before you now. We've heard this prayer, Lord. We've heard this prayer during trouble. And I ask, oh God, right now, that you would answer us in the day of trouble. For the one who does not know you, Jesus Christ, that right now they would pray, Lord, save me. Take over. I'm losing. Forgive me of my sins. For the Christian who's been trying to do it on their own and has not looked to you in the day of trouble. Lord, may they call out to you right now. Let's just pray together in silence and seek the Lord in his face. Oh God, please hear our prayers and please work in our hearts. If one is trusted in you for forgiveness of sins and salvation, we rejoice. For the Christian who's been doing it on their own, answer them now in the day of their trouble. Save us, O Lord. We have risen and now we stand upright and we wave the flag of victory. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. If you've trusted in Christ today, please let us know. You can go to lovepensacola.org slash needprayer. You can let us know there or at Connect. Let us know. Let us know so we can rejoice. We'd love to give you a Bible. We'd love to pray with you if you'd like prayer. Please respond to the Lord and and let us know how we can help. Let's continue to sing to God from our hearts in this worship service. Please join us as we sing to our saving God.
confess our faith to the Lord. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, 
and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism and the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen and amen. As we end this morning, I would like to encourage you that you continue worshiping with us one last time as you worship this morning through giving. You can give online at our church's website at lovepensacola.org slash online giving, or you can give via check and mail it in to the church. Our address here at Klondike is 7201 Klondike Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32526. God loves a cheerful giver. Hear with me out of 1 Chronicles 29.9. The word of the Lord says, The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. Give out of the abundance of the heart this morning as you give. Via announcements-wise, we just have a few announcements to give this morning. A friendly reminder that our Zoom Bible study and prayer time will resume this week via Zoom 630. Um, this week, make sure to set time apart for your family to join in that. Also, this Thursday night will be the MEW Zoom meeting as well. I challenge you and encourage you to join that, be a part of that, encourage someone on that. Both of the links for those Zoom meetings will be sent out via email this week, so make sure to be looking for those and join us for those meetings this week. Now let us close in prayer with praying for the offering and a prayer of benediction. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness, O oh Lord. We thank you for the praises of this week as, as some have returned to having income, Lord. And we pray for those who are struggling this week, oh God. But we pray for those who you've put in their hearts to give this morning, for you love a cheerful giver, that you would use this offering and bless it, that we may use it wisely, that you give wisdom and discernment to where it should be used in this time, O oh Lord that it would go to the furtherance of the, your kingdom and the spread of your gospel, O oh Lord. Be with us this week as we continue to be light to darkness, God, as we continue to encourage one another through your word and with your word, as we spend time in prayer together this week, O oh God. Now I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you, that the Lord would make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, that the Lord would lift his countenance upon you and give you his perfect peace. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Go in his peace, O church. I once was lost in time.